I think the big takeaway there, you know, and also a, a similar takeaway to what my parents had is that like they didn't buy into the inherent limitations that others would place upon us. Right. Obviously this little girl's parents didn't buy into the fact that like, just because you're four years old doesn't mean you can't be a linguist. Right. Like it's freaking amazing. You know, for me, it was like when I was born, there were a lot of like doctors and specialists or other people that like sort of hinted to the fact that like, and I get why they did this, you know, when and kind of setting that expectation for my family to not like want to be disappointed or whatever else. But they basically told my family, like, you know, you have to be prepared for the fact that like Kyle's never going to have a normal life. He's never going to be able to live on his own, never going to be able to go and go to normal school, never going to be able to really do much of anything. And, you know, it was like, I think some parents, you know, if my parents had heard that and not having been my parents, if they'd had a different mindset, you know, some parents would be more impressionable and think like that that would actually be true. This is episode number 75 with Kyle Maynard. This episode is brought to you by Mobility Wad. Do you struggle to get into good positions in your training and workouts? Are your movement compensations causing you undue pain and grief? MWAD's belief is that every human being should be able to perform basic maintenance on themselves. For nearly 10 years, Mobility Wad has been the go-to for the world's best athletes and teams. Do you know what hundreds of Olympic and world-class athletes, professional teams in the NFL, MLB, basketball, hockey, rugby, and soccer, and dozens of universities all have in common? They use Mobility Wad to train and compete at their best. I first took Dr. Kelly Surratt's movement and mobility course in 2013, and since then have read his books and followed his videos for ideas on how to address my own movement restrictions. But sometimes having all this information can become overwhelming, which is why I think the real genius is in the MWOD subscription. As part of this subscription, you have access to not only hundreds of hours of video content that can be filtered based on your specific questions, but also a daily 10 minute mobility wad video. You just log in and follow Kelly's instructions as if he is there coaching you in person for 10 minutes per day. You may pick up certain exercises that you wish to incorporate on a regular basis before or after your workouts. But at the very least, by following this daily program, you know you are addressing a wide range of movement patterns and body parts on a regular basis without having to think about it. I often do these sessions first thing in the morning or before bed as a way to wind down from the day. In addition, you have access to an on-ramp sequence and a 14-day mobility challenge that helps you understand the basics and identify the areas you personally need to focus on. You can lean on the MWOD community and discussion boards to learn from others who have been through similar situations or injuries. And if you need more personalized help, you can use the MWOD list to find a like-minded practitioner in your area. It's easy to become part of the Mobility Wad community, but for being a Pursuing Health listener, you can receive 20% off an annual membership with code Julie Fouché. That's J-U-L-I-E-F-O-U-C-H-E-R. Just visit www.mobilitywad.com. Full potential, full power. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Julie Fouché, family medicine resident and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring to you information and inspiration from experts and everyday individuals for how to use lifestyle to maximize health. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Pursuing Health and happy holidays. I have been dying to share this next conversation with you. It's one that I recorded with a pretty amazing person named Kyle Maynard. And if you're not familiar with him yet, um, he's a motivational speaker, best-selling author, entrepreneur, SB award-winning mixed martial artist, CrossFit box owner, and now a photographer as well. And he's achieved all of this despite being born with congenital amputation or a condition that has left him with arms that end up the elbows and legs that end near his knees. And what I think is so amazing about Kyle's story is that even as a young child, his parents had been told by doctors basically to expect that he would not be able to live a very normal life because of his physical condition. But his parents 
really essentially disregarded this information and tried to instill a positive attitude in Kyle and tried to encourage him that he could really do anything he set his mind to. And he's really taken that above and beyond in everything he's done from sports in middle school and high school. He became a very successful wrestler. Um, to After that, he actually started doing CrossFit. And I first heard of him or saw him from a video of him doing the CrossFit sectionals back in 2010, where he climbed Stone Mountain in Georgia. And that actually sparked his interest initially in mountaineering. And so from there, he began to train and set these goals. And eventually, he became the first quadruple amputee to reach the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro. And later, he also climbed Mount Aquangaga um, without the aid of prosthetics, which was a incredible accomplishment. So I'm really excited that I got to sit down and chat with Kyle, someone that I've been following peripherally for a while, but we, and we've met here and there, but haven't really had a chance to sit down and chat. And we had so much to talk about. We went in a lot of different directions that I wasn't even expecting. We talked a lot about medicine. um, And so I think you'll really enjoy this episode. A few quick reminders before we get started. First, there are a couple of exciting opportunities coming up this January. One, we are hosting a free two-week trial of my online training program through Beyond the Whiteboard. You can register for it anytime between January 2nd through the 8th, and the first 50 people to register will receive a free train t-shirt. So this is the actual programming that I'm doing now while I've been in medical school and in residency. It's very efficient. It's very comprehensive. Just for 60 minutes, five days a week, you're in and out of the gym. It's great for people who can't often make it to a class or working out on their own in the garage or elsewhere. And we also have an amazing online community to help hold you accountable. So you can check out more about that at trainwithjuliefouché.com. Also, if you're looking to dial in your nutrition this January, I'm very excited to again be partnering with functional dietitian nutritionist Bridget Tickemeyer, as well as my husband, Danny, who's also a physician, to bring you the Healthy Self Reset Program. It's a 100% free program, and we provide you with 28 days of recipes, meal plans, shopping lists, and workouts that you can do from anywhere with no equipment. Um, Essentially, we just want to help you press reset in the new year to help you establish habits that you're going to be able to sustain for the entire year, not just for a few weeks in January. Um, We bring you all these recipes that are dairy-free, gluten-free, very rich in vegetables and nutrients. And last year, it was an amazing experience. So hopefully you guys can join us this year. You can sign up. Again, it's a 100% free program. Sign up at healthyselfreset.com. Also, as always, if you're enjoying the podcast, please head over to iTunes where you can subscribe and consider giving it a rating. It really does make a difference. I'm also always looking for inspiring stories to share. So if you or someone you know has used lifestyle to overcome a serious health challenge, please send your story to me at info at juliefouché.com and I'll select some to share here on future episodes. Finally, please remember that although I am now officially a doctor, this podcast is meant to share the experiences of individuals and does not provide medical advice. So let's get going. Episode number 75 of Pursuing Health featuring Kyle Maynard is coming right up. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm super excited to be here with Kyle Maynard. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you. And Big, we, the honor. <laughs> we were just talking about um, when we met in 2013, we were both spectating at the CrossFit Games. So it's been a while. We have a lot to catch up on, I think, today. But um, I don't know if I told you about this then, but I was looking back, I think the first time where I had heard about you, I saw a video of you doing the Filthy 50 at your gym, um, No Excuses okay. CrossFit. And yeah. I, it was, I think... It was probably most of during my first, well, it was 2011. So during my first year of med school, like only a few months in, and I wrote this blog post about just like trying to process this whole, we were doing anatomy lab and like learning all this basic stuff about the human body and just trying to process all these things and about how everyone's body is so different. And we all have these different kind of like unique obstacles that come up throughout our lives. And I you posted that video at the bottom of it and got so many great responses of people 
um, being like, wow, really, I can't make any excuses for anything, seeing how you did Filthy 50, and it was really inspiring. Wow. So I had no idea. <laughs> that's, that's so cool. Yeah. That's awesome. I was just looking back have... at that the other day, so it's funny. What was the first year that you competed in the games? Um, 2010. Okay. So yeah. That was the first year yeah, I was I remember, in I LA. Like right when you came on the scene, because it was like I was like a instant huge fan. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like six weeks old, wearing like uh, Wolverine gear and stuff. So. Oh yeah. My dad grew up like around Michigan oh, and all I that. Oh, so It's like. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I was definitely I was definitely a huge fan of you at that point, not even knowing that you had posted that yeah. <laughs> about me. That's like that's, that's kind of trippy. Funny. That's awesome. Go blue. <laughs> Go blue. <laughs> right. That's funny. Last weekend was kind of rough, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I was in school, we were not, we did not have a very good time at football, so I kind of got used to it, but. <laughs> um, but anyways, for those of you who are not familiar with Kyle, who are listening, um, we obviously met through CrossFit, but he's done a lot of other exciting things that I want to talk about today. Um, but. Can you just tell us, so, you know, you were born without any arms or legs below the elbows or knees, correct? Right. Um, and you live an amazingly normal life. I think, I don't know why it's so surprising, but it's just so amazing to see even in like videos of you just going about doing your daily things. Um, do you have any like first memories or ever like as a child, like first realizing that you were had to work harder to do hmm. some things i remember like that's a that's a really interesting question um <laughs> let's uh yeah kind of j- jump right into like the <laughs> to the hot seat um i think i i think when i was a when i was a kid i do remember when i was like baby I, like my first kind of memory of that like struggling with something was trying to like open something up and I don't remember mm-hmm. if it was like a like a jar or like yeah lid you know we were kind of just knew that there was like something different and there's mm-hmm. a struggle there and 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 strangely too one thing that stands out was my um grandmother used to have this uh this green sugar canister ah. and uh, <laughs> you know she was like a south georgia woman yep. and like they're you know wasn't much paleo going on in that, <laughs> that environment. So like she uh so she had this green sugar canister and it was the deal was with that is that she had this like sugar scooper inside of it. Mm-hmm. And you know, for people to get a visual, my arms and kind of like right at my elbows and my legs and right at my knees, right? And I've only known that mm-hmm. since I was you know, I mean that's the only way I've ever known my entire life. And um you know, with the sugar canister, she had have the sugar scooper inside there. And when I go and pick something up, I usually kind of come to a point with my arms to go and like grab hold of something and then like scoop it up. Mm-hmm. And, but I could only fit one of my arms inside of the sugar jar. Oh, and so get the scooper. I couldn't, you know, come to a point. Right. So it was like, I had to like go and like reach into this thing and then kind of like precariously balance this like sugar scooper with like one arm and yeah. then like pull it out and like try to you know, spill sugar all over the ground. And like, that was like my reward, but (laughs) yeah, it was so incredibly frustratingly difficult, but it was also like a strange, like addiction to it too, because like, I just, I I loved it. And sometimes like from what, you know, she would say, or my mom would say, is I just like sit there for, you know, like extended periods of time, like failing repeatedly and then eventually go and like get it out. Mm -hmm. Well, what an amazing skill to have to build from a young age of sticking with something and then figuring out a way to do it. Yeah. It's, that's kind of an interesting like way to think like it's probably definitely the best thing that sugar's ever brought to my <laughs> life. I think, in that regard. <laughs> right. Maybe it was good for you. You didn't get as much sugar. You had to work, you had to work harder for it. <laughs> that's funny. What, what was it like? What do you think your parents and I guess your grandmother was also a pretty big influence on you growing up. Um, what what qualities about them and how they raised you do you think made you so successful? A big thing that comes to mind is their general imagination, I think, in terms mm-hmm. of like solutions. Um, you know, my dad, my grandpa were engineers and 
Um, you know, my dad, as I mentioned, kind of had a fascinating, you know, journey himself is like he, so he grew up in, in Michigan and, um, wasn't really a great student, uh, academically went to like, a Elma college, sort of like a division mm-hmm. two or three school and his, um, like, uh, you know, freshman year of college and was playing football and wrestling, got injured, you know, was not doing great in school. And so he ended up, uh, basically dropping out, went into the military, the military kind of gave him the discipline to, you know, straighten up and, mm-hmm. and come back and try it again. And so he, he did. And, you know, after I was born, like actually went and, uh, graduated with a electrical engineering degree. So, for wow. like, you know, Indiana Purdue, a big kind of transition. And, um, the, um, but I think for, for him, for my grandpa, you know, both of them, they were so creative because my grandpa was an electrical, electrical engineer too. Okay. And like that engineering mindset was critical in kind of cultivating like the belief that there was a tool that was available to do whatever we needed to do. Mm-hmm. And so anytime that we were stuck, you know, anytime that I was stuck with anything significant, it was like, okay, well that's just because I haven't figured out whatever the tool is that I need to use to go and do whatever we need to do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was another kind of critical thing was just to be able to like imagine what it was. And the most important thing though, I think was the fact that they disregarded a lot of the advice that a lot of doctors gave when they said that I would never really, you know, live a normal life. And that was important to go and have all these adaptations and all these things in my life. They said, you know, really just to, to, to ask that question of like, why, like, why can't Kyle live a normal life mm-hmm. and try to do whatever they could to facilitate that. That's amazing. Um, and you, when I, I know you made the decision not to use any prosthetics at what point it was that even ever something that crossed your mind or was it a decision that you made or, or is it just not even an option from the beginning for you? No, actually I, I did use them when I was like, um, a little kid and it just like, I, I used them very begrudgingly and okay. <laughs> as little as I possibly could <laughs> and doctors, you know, so I have, I have two feet and they're actually, um, tremendously helpful for me to go and do random, random things, whether mm-hmm. it's like in jujitsu and grabbing hold of somebody. I have mm-hmm. actually, you know, it's people, I mean, if they look at a video or whatever and kind of zoom in on what I'm talking about here, they can, mm-hmm. it's, it's, <laughs> it's definitely, it's, it's, I know it's, in, it, I don't know. It's different. I have one foot that's like kind of, you know, attached a little bit differently, I guess you could say like, but it's, um, I call it my like upside down foot okay. and I, you know, literally use that to go and like grip almost like a monkey, you know, on top of someone, you know, with like with jujitsu, um, mm-hmm. and doctors with prosthetics, they, they thought that it could be really important to, you know, amputate my feet and like round them out. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, thankfully my dad and mom, they went and got other opinions and it was, uh, clear that, you know, doctors were like, look, you can always take away, but you can never add back to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I tried using prosthetics and stuff like that for a while and I just, I hated it. Um, but I used it in the last, last time I did kind of the final straw was like about a month into kindergarten. And, uh, I used to have to have a teacher help pick me up out of my seat, carry me over to the middle of a circle, set me down, pass me my, you know, in this instance, and just show and tell, she would pass me my toy and, you know, I'm trying to show the group. I've got these big prosthetic arms on, hooks on the ends and, mm-hmm. you know, the big prosthetic legs and they were, the technology was way different. So the, the knee was like a locking mechanism that was like, you know, it was just like a hinge in the knee. There was no technology really behind it. It was just like a stilt basically with lock in place. And when you'd sit, you'd collapse a, a, you'd press a buckle and it would like go and collapse the knee. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in this, uh, show and tell class, I was trying to show, like I would, <laughs> it would definitely be a bad idea to bring this to show and tell now, but I had this <laughs> army green machine gun and I'm trying to like show the kids yeah. my gun and like, I'm trying to take the hook and pull the trigger on the gun and I can't do it. And I fail and I'm like fumbling with it and I drop it on the ground and I'm mm-hmm. super embarrassed and like teacher passes it to me again. I still can't do it. My mom was watching and I, I just begged her to let me come to school without the arms and legs on the next day. 
And because uh, at home I didn't wear them. I mm-hmm. just run around with my sisters and, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was fine. And and she talked to the teacher and the teacher agreed to let me come and do, do it. And kind of <laughs> from what I had heard, you know, the teacher was like, all right, well, just wait to bring Kyle to the second half of school tomorrow. And like, she's like, I'll talk to the kids in the first half. And then she later said that it took like two or three hours to like explain to the class, like why Kyle like had arms and legs yesterday. He's not (laughs) going to today. (laughs) And so, which is kind of a cool thing. You know, if you think about like the kids at five years old, they're like, whoa, what's going on? (laughs) Yeah. Like, is anybody else going to not have arms and legs the next day? Am I I not going to have arms and legs the next day? Yeah. For kindergartners, that's so funny. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, the teacher, they said that, um, you know, at the end of the day that they liked me better like that. And that was, you know, I got to run around. I got to go and play with them mm-hmm. just like I would have, have at home and with my sisters. Mm-hmm. And, and then that was the last time I ever wore them. I have to imagine, too, just, you know, that, that ha- like, you, it's not like you ever had those extra limbs. And so yeah. it would be a huge adjustment for you. It's, like, not normal to have them, especially if they're not your own, you know. So I can imagine feeling very restricted i mean you 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 get this to geek out on like the the biochemistry side of things for a second right like you Mm -hmm. think about like the the formation of the myelin in our brain you know think about the formation of our motor function and all that like um you know the i'm sure most of your audience is probably well aware and educated on this but like the you know myelin for instance sort of is like the forms that like neural network of like highways if you imagine like a highway being made of asphalt well, like the lining of your brain is basically made with like with myelin right mm-hmm. kind of in the same way that that like you line up highway with asphalt and so you know the main period of growth that you're going to go and have with that is obviously it's like you know from turning into a single cell into you know, into a baby. And then that period of growth in time, you know, when you're a baby up, you know, four or five years old, like that's a massive period of growth for your, your brain. And, you know, so for me, for instance, like, um, you know, see if I can find something as an example, right? Like if I'm going to go and pick up like here, like, uh, you know, headphones or something Mm -hmm. like that, or like, you know, anything, my cell phone or whatever, like, you know, in my head, then my brain has only been programmed one way to go and do that. Right. Right. And so like, while it kind of, I think gives me like the unfair advantage of like making it look like it's kind of more difficult in a lot of ways, it's, it's easier, I think, than people would realize because it is the only way that I've ever known, you know, and if you compare and contrast that to someone who is, you know, 25 years old, that's like a veteran, goes overseas, you know, or like, you know, gets blown up, loses, mm-hmm. you know, multiple limbs, every bit of hardwiring in their brain, you know, all of that development, all of that like myelination, all of that growth that happened, you know, when they were a kid to go and develop their motor function, it's all wired towards doing something with a hand. Mm-hmm. And my brain literally, it never developed that never, you know, so it literally, I think if you put a hand on me, you wouldn't know what to do. do Yeah. It'd be interesting. I always wonder, I was like, if I could just like, would have a hand like appear like there without like any, you know, subsequent change in my brain, like, would I be able to even do anything with it? Probably not. I'm sure you would, I'm sure you would learn, you'd lay down some new myelin eventually, but, (laughs) but yeah, it's very interesting to think about. Um, when you, so I know now you have a niece, correct? Yes. I've got a niece who is five and a nephew who is two and change right now. So, so seeing them grow up and, you know, you know, if you ever have kids of your own or if parents ever ask you for advice, what's the best advice you can give to help nurture kids so that they can really embrace and overcome adversity? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, and this may be because I saw last night, one of the trippiest videos I've ever seen in my mm. entire life. What is that? <laughs> uh, 
don't know if you've seen this or heard about this, but there was like a video on YouTube. There's like a seven year old girl, no four year old girl, a four year old girl in Russia who can speak fluently seven different languages. Whoa. She like, I was like watching this like video of her speaking, uh, Russian, English, Arabic, French, German, Chinese, and, uh, yeah, I think one other, but it was like, she's four years old and she was not, not just like speaking, she was reading from four languages. (laughs) How did that happen? She's four years old reading from seven languages. It's like, it's, it's trippy. And it's like, and she was having a blast doing, I mean, literally like, she's just like, you know, like at first she was like shy and on stage. I mean, she's on stage in front of like a live studio audience and tons Mm -hmm. of people. And she was really nervous. And then all of a sudden she's like getting into it and you start seeing her. She's just like, (laughs) she's beating They're Like they give her like these like flower petals every time that she like does it well. And then she like goes and puts this up on the giant flower and she's like, (laughs) it's a game, you know, she's having a freaking blast. Yeah. I think the big takeaway there, you know, and also a, a similar takeaway to what my parents had is that like, they didn't buy into the inherent limitations that others would place upon us. Right. Mm -hmm. Obviously this little girl's parents didn't buy into the fact that like, just because you're four years old doesn't mean you can't be a linguist. Right. Like it's (laughs) It's amazing. Yeah. You know, for me it was like when I was born, there were a lot of like doctors and specialists or other people that like sort of hinted to the fact that like, and I get that why they did this, you know, and, and kind of setting that expectation for my family to not like want to be disappointed or whatever else. But they basically told my family, like, you know, you have to be prepared for the fact that like Kyle's never going to have a normal life. He's never going to be able to live on his own, never going to be able to go and go to normal school, never going to be able to really do much of anything. Wow. And, you know, it was like, I think some parents, you know, if my parents had heard that and not having been my parents, if they'd had a different mindset, you know, some parents would be more impressionable and think like that that would actually be true. Mm -hmm. And it is like kind of like the main thing that I'm fascinated with right now in life and philosophy of like the idea of like, what is that truth? Right? Mm -hmm. Like Alfred Korzybski, um, he's like the father of general semantics. He said in 1931, he said, the map is not the territory. Meaning, like, um, the territory is whatever, you know, reality is, but we all create maps linguistically to go and describe whatever that territory is. Mm -hmm. The difference is all you got to do is, like, look at, like, a discussion between, like, a paleo and a vegan, or all you got to do is look at a, you know, conversation between, like, a, you know, like, a Trump or Hillary supporter or, mm-hmm. or, you know, take any sort of polarized opposite thing. Right. Like, I don't know, like, you know, CrossFit versus someone who hates Don CrossFit. Like, <laughs> right. and you see that we all walk around relating to our maps as if those maps are reality. And, you know, in many cases we're willing to go and die and kill each other over, over that, like belief in that map instead of just acknowledging the fact that like those are just simply maps Mm -hmm. and some maps are more useful than others. You know, a map is only going to be as useful as it is to the accuracy of the territory. But the only way to actually know what the territory is, the only way to know what reality is, is to go and give up thinking that we know what that, what the map actually, what what it, what it is, right. We have Mm -hmm. to go and discover it. We have to go and create the new map. And so there's so many assumptions that were made about me and my life and how I was born and all that, that like if my parents had bought into those assumptions, I I know for a fact it would just, it would have been a very different experience of life. For sure. For sure. That's deep. (laughs) And it's so true. I think I've, I've been really fascinated by this too. And especially like being in the medical field, it's such a struggle because so many times you know, you're taught these statistics about, you know, what are your chances of survival with X and Y disease? Or, you know, what is the life expectancy for this? And, you know, there's a lot of people who want to know that and, you know, find comfort in that. But I think there's so many people who then take that and it Mm. can limit them because they say, oh, I have five years, you know, I've only got five years. When there's so (sighs) many stories of people who, who, 
never know what that time is. Maybe it's six months, but no one ever tells them they end up living five or 10 more years because they don't set that expectation. Um, and I think our beliefs and our thoughts are so much more powerful than people realize. Um, yeah. But it's something, I mean, I, I got really fascinated with it just in terms of athletics and competing and thinking about what type of beliefs and things that you're telling yourself as you're competing and how powerful that can be, but it's extends so much more beyond that for sure. You know, it's, um, I, I can't agree more. And it's, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that role plays of belief and, and medicine, like in, you know, in the future is actually when I told you, like I got a chance to speak for the, the American like Academy of family physicians and all yeah. that this year, it was, which, you know, for people that don't know, you know, like family physician, what, what you are, mm -hmm. are, in residency practicing, then you, you are literally with someone throughout their whole life from basically from birth to end of life. You have, you know, a lot of amazing people, especially, you know, I think in like more rural communities and things like that, where like people don't have access to, you know, sort of a traditional healthcare mm -hmm. system or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, some, some pretty awesome things can come in that, but what, one of the the main things that I talked about in that talk was exactly what you just alluded to there was like, what will the future of medicine look like when it incorporates those elements of, of belief, right? Mm -hmm. And how can we go about, you know, doing things a little bit differently to, um, to help people with, with, with that belief too, right? Mm -hmm. Using reality. I mean, like one of the thoughts that just popped into my head, what you mentioned, right? If you take somebody you know, say, say you have some like a disease. My grandmother, she battled a grade four glioblastoma, you know, and um, grade four, like a, a terrible, like nasty brain mm -hmm. tumor. And mm -hmm. she passed from it eventually, you know, and was basically told like this is like a death sentence. And it, it is like a super gnarly tumor. Right. And I mean, maybe has like over 90 percent mortality, if not more like um, however, like, you know, there's there were so many things that like we could have could have done there that had, um, some level of, uh, like, uh, like just off the top of my head, like, you know, I can't remember if it was like, if you fast for like 28 hours or 48 hours, mm -hmm. but before receiving a radiation treatment and it increases the efficacy of that, like, uh, the effectiveness of that radiation treatment by like 300%, something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's, um, there's little things that we can go and do that just have this like huge impact. Right. Right. And so I think in medicine, we just go and look at these like massive, like averages you have, you know, and if you tell someone like, Oh, you've got a 10% survival rate. Well, you know, yeah. You know, I know that you're like a 30 year old, you know, a uh, healthy person, you know, <laughs> like you, right. you know, all that, very but big like, difference. that includes like the 80 year old, whatever. That's like, not healthy and everybody in between, you know, right. and like, we just don't look at things like that. That's like a, that's a crappy map, you know, it's, it's, it's just, yeah, it's describing like a broad general population, but it's not getting down to like, like actually describing like what it is, you know, if you go and have someone who's, you know, taking all of these steps and actions to go and then have a different outcome. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, well now maybe you have a 60% survival rate in this instance. It's right. like, what? Oh, okay. Right. Like yeah. taking your so, individual yeah. circumstances into account, it could be very different. And I think that's one of the limit, you know, we have medicine is more and more evidence-based and we have so much more research now, but that's the biggest limitation I think of these big studies is that it's all looking at a population and the average, um, and so I think even moving forward, we're starting to look more at genetics, starting to look more at all these different factors and how each individual person might respond differently to a drug or to a treatment or, you know, have different outcomes. So I think there's, you know, it's going to be exciting to see what happens in the future, but you bring up a really good point. Everyone is very, very different. <laughs> What's your theory until how long uh, folks in Silicon Valley are living to be a thousand? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I mean, a thousand, maybe much, but <laughs> yeah, um, it's, uh... I don't know. I also think that there's probably, there's probably a limit on how long, I don't know that people will live. I don't, I don't know. I, I think that it's, there's probably things that we can do to like maximize that lifespan, but I think there's probably a limit. Like we're probably not meant to be around here forever. <laughs> 
I don't think we're meant to be around here forever. I just wonder if we'll get to a point where we're actually able to like stop like telomere shortening and things like that and like create, you know, basically like kind of create that like, you know, kind of live forever or like seemingly forever like scenario, you know, like stop aging. Like it's like from a technological perspective. I just wonder if that's, you know, what like impact would that have on the world and like like the ethical issues that emerge from that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to think about. And the other thing I was just thinking as you were talking about beliefs is it can be so much simpler too and like on a smaller scale of just the beliefs that we're telling ourselves every day and like seeing people who just think, oh, I'm I'm never going to be able to be like eat healthy or ever going to be able to exercise mm. or whatever, the environment that they grew up in and then the beliefs that they have about themselves and what they're capable of. And how huge of an impact that can have on their health and their quality of life and like their overall experience. So yeah. it's a huge, I think, you know, there's huge potential with these small things like, you know, the way that we think, the way that we eat, the way we move, all of those things have such a huge impact on our health. Yeah, it's, uh, this is like, it will sound kind of like super like <laughs> anti-motivational for a second, but I'll, <laughs> hopefully he'll bring it back. <laughs> Bring it back if you stick with me for, okay. for 30 seconds. But, um, you know, I've realized that like a big part of like my, um, big part of what's helped me and also like how, you know, I, I feel best to, like help other people if I'm like working with anybody in any level, like, you know, friend, otherwise, like just in conversation, like if I hear something like that, of like, oh, or it could be even like, um, like, you know, oh, like you live in San Diego. Like I love, I love, I would love to like live there, but I can't, you know, I've got like my family and my work mm-hmm. here and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, well people will act as if there's like a physical constraint that's keeping them geographically in some area. Mm. Right. They act as if like, no, I like, they, like I can't move. Like I, I can't, like I physically can't, right. like they're like really like locked in cement <laughs> and they can't go somewhere. And it's interesting, like they, they, like in their language, it shows up that way. But I think that people actually feel that way. Mm-hmm. And then they go and start to go and imagine it. That that's kind of a completely imagined thing. And yeah, yeah. of course, there are certain like, you know, if you have a family of four, like if you just like up and leave in the middle of the night, there's going to be an impact, you know? Right. And so it's like you aren't going to, you know, do that without other consequences and other impact on other people. But at the same time, like even if you have a family of four to say that like you're stuck in one area, like that's, that's not true. Right. Like you can go and, you know, there's, there's conversations and discussions. There's, there's a number of different ways, but anyway, like I think that like a big part of what I like to do is kind of like introduce doubt into people Mm -hmm. in that way. Like I want to make people, you know, it's like, I think that doubt, you know, is, is really doubt is just an uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And and I think that the, the the beauty of doubt and the beauty of uncertainty is that like it just allows us like a little bit of room to be able to go and think and think in a, in a different way. Mm-hmm. And I think about like uh, you know in night I think it was like 1964 1965 Ansel Keys took over the American Heart Association and and started you know his campaign mm-hmm. with the the lipid hypothesis right where mm-hmm. he basically was saying that like fat causes heart disease and saturated fat and all of these things and all that and like he in his research like left out huge samples of of data that like showed up like for instance like you know, in his research, like showing that like fat causes heart disease, like he like completely left out like France and I think Switzerland and like a number of other places where mm-hmm. like the top two saturated fat consuming countries, I think in Europe at the time were France and Switzerland also right. like number one and two with like the lowest incidence of heart disease. So he goes and completely removes them out of the, out of the data. And then he goes and like throws out this lipid hypothesis that saturated fat and all this stuff and uh, cholesterol cause heart, heart disease. And, you know, that becomes then truth in, in like, you know, in, in modern medicine and, and doctors that are like way, way, way smarter than me go and, and, and relate to that as, as like fact and reality mm-hmm. for a significant chunk of time. Right. And instead of like having a healthy amount of doubt 
about that Mm -hmm. where it's like you can it like the doubt just gets you to go and doubt it enough just to go and open up to be able to go and hear what somebody else is saying and go and say you know because like if you commit something with like a belief of like no, I'm not listening to it. Absolutely not. Right. <laughs> you know, like, and I know that you doesn't do it fit with my time. belief system. Right. And in medicine, it's like pervasive. It's like way more than in anything else. And it's like you get people that are just like, you know, they you just see their like their micro expressions and their face change like immediately to like anger if you go and bring up something that's different than what they believe. And it's like, no, just like. <laughs> You know, chill out. You know, in, in all things that I believe, I want to go in and bring that same amount of doubt too, because I realize that that allows me to go and look at it and re-examine it. And if I can go and look at that data and then re-examine it, and I can go and then formulate a different, you know, opinion, or maybe it's the same opinion, but I have a different way of looking at it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. Medicine, there's, I think it's one of the slowest fields to change too, and. You, we still, I still see it on a regular basis where people are recommending low fat um, diets for high cholesterol or for heart disease. Um, it's slow, slow to change. And even if you look back at like how long it took from the time, the first time that we had actual data that showed us that smoking caused lung cancer, until you know we were actually making moves to get people to quit smoking, it's right. decades. You know, wow. so it's it's. It's frustrating at times, but then you also, I mean, what's the alternative? You have to try and try and keep moving things forward, but um, it's very slow to change. And I'm not sure. I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons why that is, but. And some good reasons too, you know, like mm-hmm. we, if we were kind of flippantly like going with whatever, you know, and we kind of do in, in some ways, some circles, but like, you know, go to like, just believe anything that like comes up. It's like trendy, you know, I think we can kind of all fall and pray to that, like herd mentality of like, right. you know, yeah, just like the trends, but it's frustrating when, you know, you get anybody on any level, about any belief that gets so locked into the fact that like they're right, other people are wrong, whatever. And it's like all communication stops, mm-hmm. all, all Good progress. Like, yeah, yeah like conversation, like thought and yeah, you know, so I, true. I used to be, frankly, I mean, this is like, you know, like with like stupid example, but like the whole like paleo and vegan conversation or whatever, you know, like I had the honor of having like my name on the back of like Rob Wolf's book, mm-hmm. you know, the paleo solution back in the day. And like, you know, I definitely got some like hate messages like every now and then from like people that were, you know, like, and it, you know, it's that actually go and went and gave me a certain view of like, you know, like, Oh, like this like peaceful loving community of like vegans that really are just like these like crazy, like terrorists, (laughs) you know, but then, you know, I went and when I moved to San Diego, I lived above a restaurant cafe gratitude. That was an entirely like vegan restaurant. I was like, Oh man, this is actually really freaking good. Yeah. (laughs) You know? So it's, um, I think it's, uh, kind of, uh, it's just up to us to be able to, like we were talking about earlier with, um, regards to, you know, the things that the doctor said about me growing up or whatever, you know, like they, they, it's not that they should have like told my parents like, oh yeah, like clearly like, yeah, Kyle, you know, like he'll be able to go and climb mountains. He'll be able to you know, compete in wrestling or MMA, things like that. No, it's like, but like they, they could have like left it open to like, like a discovery and like a possibility, like mm-hmm. of what was there that they just, you know, by having a, like a lack of imagination, I think it kind of closed down a lot of possibilities that with a different set of parents, I would have had a very different outcome. I would have had a very different life and doctors forget how powerful they are in that way. Mm-hmm. And setting people's beliefs and setting people's expectations, which is like why, you know, when I got to go and talk to that group there, like I told you, it's it's just I wanted them to know like how important it was to always leave people with hope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I believe. I mean, they, you know, that there's a, there's a debate even with that, you know, and like you have certain people that are like, oh, we need to be as pragmatic as possible and all that. Like I'm I'm all for pragmatism, but 
it's it's like a really nasty kind of insidious like ex- excuse mm-hmm. to leave people mm-hmm. without hope yeah and i think there's a difference too between recognizing like this is what we're up against this is the obstacle like you know this is what we're dealing <laughs> with but that doesn't mean we can't overcome it or we can't yep. you know move in the right direction to to take steps to get better um i think that's really powerful I'm so I'm upset that I missed that because I was at that conference last year, so I should have gone again yes, this year. That would year. have been so crazy if you were there. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, that would have been really cool. <clears throat> wow. Well, anyway, I want to talk a little bit too about all of your athletic feats um, because you've been up to a lot since the last time we talked. But um, can you just start, maybe start off and talk about how you got into sports in the first place and kind of what role those had in you growing up, and then. Um, we'll go from there. Yeah, the um, yeah, sports were huge growing up. Um, you know, just as you know, as you know, it's like it just it it's it teaches you so much about life mm-hmm. and about like yourself and like your you know you know just movement in general. I mean, it it teaches you so much. And, and for me, I think it was just super critical. I, it, it was always like playing backyard sports growing up with friends, like um, you know, backyard you know, like baseball games and stuff like that. But like, you know, street hockey games, like, um, I was the goalie, you know, and like, it was, you know, I was five years old playing with these like kids that were middle school and high school and thinking <laughs> I was like the baddest dude in the block. You know? like, <laughs> um, it, so yeah, it was like, uh, kind of started there and just was a huge sports fan and we moved down to Georgia and like, I, you know, could, could like, basically like tell you like any, you know, any like baseball players, like pitching ERA or like any, anything like that, you know, like any, any of the wow. data stuff. And I desperately wanted to go and play. And I, I brought like a, a flyer home from school and told my mom that I wanted to play football and thankfully had the most amazing coach who in football and, and then a different coach, um, coach Ramos in wrestling. They were just like, like, yeah, like let's figure it out. So I played football and I wrestled and, you know, in football the way to tackle people was I was down in all fours and, you know, in sixth grade, I weighed like 65 pounds and, you know, that was, I would just get in the middle and like clog the hole and take my helmet and try to like ram it into the guy's <laughs> shins as hard as I could to take him, take him out. Um, and wrestling was different. It was, um, I lost every single match for a year and a half and hated it and begged to quit. And my dad, even the most amazing thing was like, he, if he were talking to you and, um, being honest with you, he would have thought he would have told you that like he thought that I never would have won a match, mm-hmm. and yet he still kind of continued to go and push me. Me and my mom were the only ones that were delusional enough to think that I would ever <laughs> have the possibility of winning. And like, wow. Um, but yeah, I ended up uh, I won my first match a year and a half into into wrestling, and then just kind of never looked back. And ended up like fast forward, I, I mostly just stick stuck to wrestling senior year of high school or all the way through high school, mm-hmm. the football kids kept getting bigger and in wrestling I could compete against somebody that was in my weight class. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, ended up, you know, people were basically when I started, they were saying like it was borderline child abuse. My mom and dad were making me do it. And by the oh. time I was done, you know, they were saying like, it was a different conversation, you know, and it yeah, was like, around. We don't want to wrestle that, him. <laughs> yeah. It was, I got at 18 years old, got to do a big, you know, it was like the first big media thing I got to do where they, um, it was a story on HBO real sports. Mm-hmm. And part of the story was like this, like controversy of whether or not I was unfairly advantaged. Wow. You know, so I was stronger relative to my weight class going up against somebody else. Like, um, I didn't have, you know, the pesky extra arm and leg weight. Right. Mm-hmm. So I like, I'm kind of power core. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. Very interesting different perspective for you I'm sure it was mostly from the parents of kids that I beat but you know, <laughs> sore losers yeah. oh yeah. that's interesting it's so interesting it brings me back to that sugar um canister when you talked about losing for a year and a half and then yeah. finally winning it's like seeing that play out in your life it's really it's really really cool it's, um so yeah, then, I mean, it's been there consequently, like, I mean, nonstop, yeah. you know, it was like the first time, um, I put on a sock, mm-hmm. took 
pair of socks for somebody that it took 45 minutes, you know, now it takes five seconds, you know, it's like kind of, you know, it's just with all things, it's, it's just, you know, it's a whole other, whole other topic to talk about during the different time or at some point, but like right now my main passion is like filmmaking and photography. Wow. Like my room, if like you were to see it, it is like destroyed right now. Cause I'm like trying to turn it into like a little like studio and like, oh, cool. um, you know, like I've been like obsessive about like trying to learn it. Like I don't want to just learn it a little bit. Like I really want to go and like this is like you know people are like what's your next mountain? I'm like this is my next mountain. You know, is the wow. like, film. And but I, I realized that like you know the first twenty or thirty thousand photos that I would go and take, they they were going to be really bad. I wasn't going to know what to do, and the settings were going to be really confusing mm-hmm. and all that. But then. You know, after I get those 20,000, that first 20,000 out of the way, then like I, I'll be so much better. Right. And so just, you know, I just want to go and shoot as much as I possibly can to get those really crappy ones out of the way, knowing that like, yeah, it's, it'll get better. Mm-hmm. What a great perspective. So then how did you eventually, was it after your wrestling career that you found CrossFit or how did you first get into CrossFit? Uh, I got my level one in 2008 and I actually opened, so it's maybe, yeah, I got my level one the summer 2008 and it was like December 2008 was when I opened my box. Okay. And so, Early. I, yeah, we were like the 10th affiliate in Atlanta or something like that. And then, um, yeah, so I'm 31 now. So this was 2008. So this is like, you know, nine, almost 10, almost coming up on 10 years pretty soon. And, uh, so yeah, I was in my early twenties and just, you know, had a little bit of a downturn in, in, in speaking and stuff too. So it was like, I just had a lot more free time. It was like kind of training a lot and mm-hmm. I'd gotten to launch a book at 19 and that's, and you know, like launched on Oprah and Larry King. And so it was like for a big period of time, it kind of like kept me busy. But the thing was with that, I was in like a really unbalanced place in my life and put on a decent amount of weight, you know, went from like being a really active wrestler to then like business traveler. And like, uh, it, yeah, it was just, you know, it was a rougher transition. I, when I, um, found CrossFit, somebody had sent me a video of, uh, of the, the nasty girls. It was, uh, (laughs) you know, like I'm sure it's gotta be online somewhere still, but like, I mean, they always yeah, say, like, make sure you Google CrossFit Nasty Girls when you're looking for it. Because <laughs> right. you might get something you don't want. <laughs> In search, it's not <laughs> But yeah, that's a, it's so funny. I think that nowadays, maybe people don't even know about it. But back then, that was how so many people found out about CrossFit. When was it that you first got into it? It was summer of 2009, so a little later. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was... Uh... Summer 2009, well, April, I did an MMA fight and had kind of, you know, prepared for it just with that, with CrossFit. It was felt, you know, stronger, more prepared than I ever had before. It was just really, mm-hmm. I fell in love with it. The thing that I loved, though, was the, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I still like absolutely like love, it was just the, you know, when Coach, Coach Glassman, you know, was sort of training people back in Santa Cruz, like, you know, he, he took things from totally unrelated, disconnected, like contexts, and he brought them together, mm-hmm. you know, of gymnastics and weightlifting and, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of traditional movement stuff and like endurance things, you know, and it was just like, why are these worlds like disconnected? Right. Right. And they just brought it together. And it's like, like philosophically, like I, I, I have told people like I connect most with my own personal life philosophy of like doing the same, of, like specializing and not specializing. Mm-hmm. Because when you, when you do that and you can go and see the, all of those different things from those different angles and you can go and connect dots in different ways that other people can't when they're, when they are focused on one thing, now, you know, so much growth happens when we go and focus in on one thing, but it becomes very myopic. Yeah. You know, we only see what we see. And in the world of medicine, like you said, like a family practitioner is, is that, you right. know, it's like 
you are literally seeing someone through the whole lifespan, like some people that are dealing with people and with, like, you know, with giving birth and all the way up to end of life care. And <clears throat> it gives you a completely different perspective on things than if you're mm-hmm. just like a specialist in one thing and you see somebody a couple of times or whatever. Right. And they're both valuable. And like we talked about that, how primary care is kind of like the CrossFit of medicine and, and, but the specialists, you know, when I first started, I thought I absolutely wanted to be a specialist because it sounds like more, almost to me, like more reassuring. Like I can know this one thing really well and I'm going right. to, I'm going to know it. Um, and it's a little more uncomfortable, kind of like CrossFit to, to do primary care because you don't, you're not an expert in everything. You have a limited amount of knowledge, but then you know when you need to call on those experts, just like yeah. in CrossFit, like maybe I need to find some Olympic weightlifting expert to help me refine my lift. Um, and the, you know, it's a valuable how they all work together, but someone has to be there on that front line to help people with their GPP or their general, you know, health and quality of life. Um, and then use those experts kind of where they're needed. Absolutely. And, you know, when, when the experts and the specialist or the specialists and the, the specialists and the, you know, generalists sort of play nicely together, then it, it can, can work, work really well. Right. Mm-hmm. But when it's, um, when they don't, and I think that's a lot of what's happened more recently, especially in terms of like family medicine and things like that, you know, you have, you know, sort of, um, kind of an assault on that, like, uh, you know, that, that type of practice, right. Like it's, um, you know, for instance, like if you're going to go and have an appointment with somebody that like last 50 or 60 minutes, like the, you know, reimbursement rate for that is, you know, sometimes challenging mm-hmm. to, to get from an insurance company or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause more medicines moving towards that direction of like, Oh, we need to only like have that 10 minute visit or less. Right. And I don't necessarily think that that's a, a really like helpful direction for us to travel. Right. I agree. Um, but I think we are, you know, we are realizing that. And I think that things are moving in a better direction, um, especially Mm. for primary care. And here soon, the reimbursement is going to be shifting more to being value based. So you're going to be reimbursed to keep a population of people healthy rather than Mm. to see as many people as you can in a day or do as many procedures. Is that happening now? It's starting to, um, like it's in the very, very early phases. Um, like we've been talking about it and preparing for it a lot at the Cleveland Clinic where I have been in school. But I think over the next couple of years, we'll see it start to actually play out. Um, so it's an ex- it's a really exciting time to be in primary care. Yeah, and especially too, you know, with, I mean, obviously like there's, there's like a, a bigger, you know, issue here. Like not everybody can go and afford, you know, like um, – like a self-pay type system, right? Like, right. you know, in, in terms of like investing in their own mm-hmm. healthcare, but there are, you know, there is a market for people that, that can and, and, you know, can and should invest in, in that type of thing. You know, mm-hmm. and I've got like very close friends that are, you know, naturopath doctors that like, you know, like are really kind of breaking the mold on what it is to be like a naturopathic doctor where mm-hmm. like it used to be, you know, kind of like, uh, here are your crystals type thing. And, you know, now it's like, it's actually like rooted in like tremendous amount of like science and they, you know, they will go and run way more extensive labs and tests on people than like, than a typical conventional doctor would. Mm -hmm. And, and that is like, it's really cool. It's really cool to see that that happening and now people becoming way more interested in, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of tracking all of that stuff. Like, you know, it's, even just talking about it, like it's, I, it's kind of a, a group that I was really connected to for a long time and I've not been recently, but it's gotten me more excited to like re-engage that, you know? And mm-hmm. I know sometimes I get in my like kicks, like the filmmaking and all that stuff now, you know, and it's a it's kind of a different, different world, but I, you know, it's, a, it's just generally like an excuse that like I'll go and make a lot of the times if I go and get like hyper focused on one thing in one area, then I'll like let, let other things go. Like I know right now, like my training has like suffered because I have been so focused on other things. Yeah. And That's you know, cool. it used to be something I'd really beat myself up over and like, mm-hmm. why would I go into that? But and now I give myself a lot more slack, but mm-hmm. it also, I realized that like the, there's, you know, a, a need for balance. Absolutely. It's just in thinking about it as different phases of life and, you know, things are going to be 
tipped one way and then the other way and you can't always be perfectly balanced um, i would say probably after having trained to compete in the games while going through med school like <laughs> <laughs> i was not i was definitely not balanced during that time i'll tell you that <laughs> those were the only two things i was doing um and then time to be a fly on the wall and see what your life is like that <laughs> <clears throat> it was fun. It was fun, but I don't think it could have lasted forever for sure. <laughs> um, so then I know that it was actually through competing. You competed, was it 2009 at the sectionals that you did the, um, 2010. 2010. Yeah, it was actually okay. the, yeah, okay. that was the, and that was, you said your first year. That was my first year. Games. So on my year, our sectionals were at the Arnold in Columbus. Um, okay. And yours was down in Georgia and yep. Stone Mountain. That's when you did the Stone Mountain climb, which was, as I understand, that's kind of the spark for what led you to get into climbing. Is that correct? Yeah. I had done one other kind of like uh, smaller climb in, uh, you know, years before, but it was like mm-hmm. 200 feet. You know, Stone Mountain was like, it was a bigger, like iconic, you know, kind of thing in Atlanta, like whenever family would come to town, like you yeah. go and take them to stone mountain and go and take a picture on the top because you'd go and ride the tram, you'd get dropped off. You'd like, mm-hmm. you know, you're sitting on the top of this thing and you're like, well, wow, like, you know, Atlanta is like so beautiful. And, you know, then you get on the tram and you'd go and you'd, you'd go yeah. back. And, uh, you know, we I'd been to the top like a dozen times before, but the difference was with this trip, it was like, um, I, um, remember, getting to the top after like an hour and 46 minutes or something like that, tearing all the skin up in the ends of my arms and like being like, Whoa, like this is actually way cooler and way more beautiful than I remember, you know? Yeah. And it was like, just with that, like kind of like, you know, the, like getting to the top on my own steam versus mm-hmm. like taking the tram just provided a totally different perspective. And it was, yeah, that night that I told my friend that I wanted to climb Kilimanjaro and she I was like, just kind of came out. I was like doing an <laughs> ice bath to go and get ready for the competition the next day. Yeah. And she said, um, she's like, you want to do what? <laughs> and I was like, I want to get on Kilimanjaro. And she was like, you're freaking crazy <laughs> with a different F word. <laughs> and like, I was like, yeah, okay. no, but I, I think I can go do it. Like if, you know, if we did this today, like, you know, yeah. we can, we can find a way to do that. And then, um, less than two years later, a year and a half later from that moment, we we're standing on the summit of Kilimanjaro. That's amazing. And what did that feel like? It was wild. I mean, there's just so much that went into like fighting to get there, but like I kept it together until I uh, called my mom on the sat phone uh-huh. and then I just bawled like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't imagine like the... crying and I just started yeah. falling. Just like the physical so... and the emotional Stress yeah, they strain. kind of all hit yeah. once. And I was also too, you know, was asked to had the most amazing, you know, honor of my life was asked by the mother of a veteran named Corey Johnson, if I would, not if I, if I would, but if her team would like, uh, carry Corey's ashes to, to the summit, Corey had, wow. you know, been killed serving overseas. And, um, you know, I met his mom five months after he had passed and she asked me, you know, she said it mean a lot to her if we'd consider doing that. And we had two veterans, Chris mm-hmm. and Sandra, that were going with us on the climb too. Wow. You know, and wanted to go and send that kind of bigger message to the veteran community. And so it was really um, getting to go and pay tribute to him there and leave his ashes there was like the single greatest honor of my life. Wow. His mom actually messaged me not that long ago on Facebook and um, – and uh, she said now that she's been thinking about like wanting to go up there too to the summit and see where we left his ashes. Wow, that's incredible! What an amazing like bigger purpose to your trip. I mean, obviously there's so many reasons why you did it, but like I'm sure there were that was something that was on your mind and that helped you through some of the the tougher times of the trip. Thinking about wanting to you know, do that for her too. Oh man, I can't, can't even describe like on the fourth night of, you know, 12 nights to the summit, I was in my tent bawling 
crying, like, why am I here? What am I doing? Like, felt like my body was in shutdown mode. I was in so much pain in my arms and my feet. And, um, you know, was like prepared to go and tell the group the next day, like, I'm done. I'm not, you know, this is too much. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a nearly 30 mile bear crawl. And, wow. um, yeah, it was, it was thinking about him, you know, and, and that was like, you know what, like, you know, he had three little girls and like, maybe someday he would have wanted to go and climb that mountain with them, you know, yeah. and, and now he's not going to go and have that choice. And, but like, I'm here and I do, and, you know, and, and I, I can do that f- for him. And it was like, I felt, felt him, you know, there with me in that tent. And it was like, yeah. It just, that's powerful. Yeah. It's changed everything there in that moment. That's super powerful. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I think for why we go and do anything, right? Like there's like a million different kind of interconnected reasons. Mm -hmm. It's usually in those, like, as, as you know, and sometimes like athletics have the opportunity too to like, get you to these sometimes harder, sometimes darker places. But it's in those moments, like to go and find that hope, to find that light, to find that like way to keep going. Like you, you end up also subsequently finding that like deeper reason why you're doing it. Mm-hmm. And it's, those moments are pretty cool. And, you know, subsequently those, those, uh, those moments don't happen in, in times of like, just in my opinion, at least they don't often happen in times of just comfort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. What, I mean, I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, why we do CrossFit, why we do things that are like physically hard or emotionally or mentally hard or, you know, why you decide to climb up mountains. Like there's so much growth that happens there from, and it is super uncomfortable, um, but there's so much growth that happens from seeking out that adversity and then, you know, learning, you know, seeing how much more you're capable of than maybe you think you are. It's, uh, yeah, they say the best mountaineers to have the shortest memory <laughs> <laughs> because every trip sucks and it's how quickly can you like forget it and can go back, you know, <laughs> after that climb and film and drop, like I'm never doing this again, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then like, few years later I'm like by myself I'm like an even taller skier mountain you know but like <laughs> that too is like absolutely beautiful knocking Cagua in South America was just like wow. wow but yeah you almost like you have to kind of like you know kind of forget like uh you know just what you, you just kind of like forget and block out like the you know <laughs> whatever the bad and like then get back in to you know um you know, just doing what you do. I mean, competition, it's like the same thing. It's like you have one bad event or something like that. Like, all right, well, time to get back on the horse, you know, and do it again. Yeah. It's like those micro moments, but you also too, you might have, you know, one bad year. I know you've had to go and battle through like injuries before and stuff as well. Um, you know, so. Yeah, it's so true. And it's like on a smaller time scale, but the same thing with CrossFit workouts. It's like you're in the middle, you have those stages of emotion during the workout we were like this is great then this is the worst thing ever why am i doing this i'm never doing this again and then as soon as you're done you're like that was awesome let's do it again tomorrow right totally yeah that, that's that forgetfulness right it's like right. the worst thing ever and then they're like ah oh, this sucks and it's like and then afterwards you're like well actually <laughs> it's, yeah that'd be cool to like sign up for something else you know it's like in the moment like if you'd ask me like you know in stone mountain you know in that time time we we're talking about there like if i were like ever wanted to go and do another mountain there like no hell no like it's terrible it sucks like it's like absolutely painful and all that stuff but then like <laughs> that night is the night that i'm talking about doing kilimanjaro yeah you know? <laughs> so That's and really those cool. were you know it's kind of I think that like a lot of times, like, you know, if we fail at something, we kind of make it like a, I don't know, more like permanent um, kind of thing that it's like always going to be tough or that way or whatever. And it's just like, it's in the like photography, videography example, 
you know, and like me saying the first 20,000 photos are invariably going to kind of suck. Like, especially if you're shooting by yourself and you don't have somebody going teaching you how to go and do it initially and you're just kind of going through and you're experimenting, then like as quickly as you go and get through those, well, then you can get to the other side, but you have to go through that period of time that it does suck. Mm -hmm. It's, and if you didn't, if it were just so easy, and then if anyone could just go and pick up any camera and go and shoot any picture that they wanted, then there would be no value in it because, like, everyone right. could be able to go and do it, and then it, like, you wouldn't have actually had to earn that. Right. So it wouldn't have mattered, right? And it's just so the actual, like, most beautiful part of things are, like, when, like, in those moments where it does suck. Like, my, one of my best friends, Jeff, he just finished up 10 years as a, as a Navy SEAL, mm-hmm. and, like, one of the most amazing human beings like on the planet and so many levels. But like one of the cool things they ever said to me, like was the day that he got the day that he was finished, we went out to dinner and, you know, we're like talking and I asked him, I was like, what was the, what was your best day as a seal? Mm-hmm. And he, uh, and he told me that it was actually like uh, the day that, was his, his worst day. And wow. I'd heard the story a million times before. Like he had actually been possibly one of the first, if not the first seals ever diagnosed with, um, with rhabdo, rhabdomyolysis, like, oh, wow. because like everybody that got it quit, but he got it and wouldn't quit. Wow. And so he basically felt like he had like cinder blocks in his boots and like, you know, they felt like, people, you know, like there was like knives stabbing him in his thighs while he's running and he's, 45 minutes behind everybody else on the run or something crazy like that, or, you know, like are way, way behind kind of the group. And like all the instructors are just like, you know, all over him, like, you know, trying to do anything they can to go and get him quit. You know, one instructor goes and like in the kind of midst of, of all this happening, goes and like grabs his helmet and takes it and like spikes it on the ground and his helmet goes shooting. This is like oh. a helmet he went and like spent hours like polishing to try to like wow. make pristine. And now this helmet is spiked off the ground and the guy's telling him like you see that ship out there like you're going to be on that like you know you're never going to be a seal like all this stuff and like even in that like worst moment he was like the only thing that I knew was that like I wasn't going to quit wow and nothing they could do was going to make me quit and um he yeah I mean took like basically once they figured out what it was, then um, <clears throat> gave him a little bit of convalescence leave to be able to go and like, you know, heal and repair. I came back mm-hmm. and did Hell Week and it was like, actually, this is pretty easy. Compared to like Hell Week was healthy, then it was totally different. And, <clears throat> but he said that that moment was like, that was his best moment. You know, and to think about like all the cool stuff he got to go and do as a SEAL, like jumping out of planes, you know, <clears throat> doing all the boy stuff that he ever could have imagined doing, yeah. shooting any gun he ever could, you know, I mean, the friend stuff, the, you know, all, you know, the diving and I mean, everything. And then like, you know, sniper, breacher, but like to go and say this favorite moment was that moment that was the worst moment. It's something that, you know, be learned from that. Like when we're in that time and we're like, this sucks yeah. to actually go and stop and think like, no, I'm, I'm actually pretty, pretty grateful for for whatever's happening here. Wow, that's really cool. Wow. Well, I want to wrap up with three questions that I ask everyone on the podcast. So the first right. one is three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health. Three things. I would say this is kind of work in progress, but one of the biggest things that comes to mind is, you know, if I'm like really upset by something, trying to like let it go and return to like sort of equilibrium as quickly as possible, you know, and just being mm-hmm. able to like realize like kind of, I don't know, just gain perspective over something and it's not the end of the world and nothing's really as ever, you know, as bad as it seems, nothing's ever as good as it seems and just kind of realize, you know, just to get it back to like that, you know, kind of even keto, like it helps me mm-hmm. tremendously. Uh, That's a great one. You know, I think having, and these, these are also two, you know, I think the answers that come to mind now are a lot different than the answers I may have given even at 25 or it might've been more like 
tactical strategy based, but like now mm-hmm. it's more about like the quality of life that I want to go and live, you know? Yeah. And I think the next thing that would be something that's greatly impacted my health would be having like a, a goal or activity or passion that has nothing to do with, with work. Mm-hmm. Like, um, <clears throat> and it's interesting whether it's like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or filmmaking or whatever, like Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, like those things that were like the biggest passions, like I I end up making them uh, a part of like my work and career. And they end up (laughs) sometimes even like the main central thing that I'm focused on. Right. But in that event too, it's like, it's awesome and I'm grateful for that, but it's like, I realize, like, and I'm kind of in that spot right now, realizing like, okay, like what is that next thing that, that I want to do and learn that has nothing to do with, with work, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, you know, just, I think, you know, for, for a while, like CrossFit was, was that form, mm-hmm. but I just loved it and every aspect of it and, and still do in many ways. So it's just like when it kind of, when I did make it like a part of my career, then it, it changed it a little bit, you know, in that, that regard. So it's like, you know, I, I just, I think that like having those things, like maybe it's just because I'm like hyper competitive <laughs> and I can't relax about stuff, but I'm like in that performance mode, but like I have to have that thing that like I'm just like enjoying in the, I don't know, the, the third thing I think would be like really open up and kind of all give yourself moments and opportunities to like love and be loved and you know whether it's hugging somebody else tighter or like you know telling somebody how much you love them and care about them like you know, the closeness of like that human connection, like they say loneliness is, is like the health equivalent of smoking like three packs of cigarettes a day, something like that. Um, yeah, those so, relationships are huge. Yeah. Like just, yeah. Some, you know, and sometimes like we could be, you know, uh, m- you know, married and still feel like lonely or something like that. We, it's not so much like we could be like around other people. Like it's mm-hmm. not like so much that, but it's like the closeness to which we are, like the closeness that we are to the human connection. And like, and, and I think the extension of that would be to go and see the human people with like radically different beliefs from ourselves that like we go and like can begin to understand, um, why they believe what they do and, kind of like really have like, like a a moment of like reserving our own like judgment or a suspension of our own map, you know, Mm -hmm. or suspension of our own rightness. Yeah. Um, that opens up for that, that moment of like that love and connection too, in a lot of ways. And it kind of ties back into the idea of like getting back to that, like equilibrium, right? Like Mm -hmm. it just, I'm not saying that like you don't, fervently like have beliefs that you believe in but like for me you know if I'm talking to someone who for instance like you know I was telling you like it was like a uh you know vegan doctor who absolutely believes in like Ansel Keys's research or something like that then like I you know I'm going to be a lot less like wigged out or stressed about like any interaction I'd going to have with anybody on that level like regardless because at the end of the day too it's like that person just wants to help people yeah and they're going to you know try to go and do what they're doing in the best way that they can. And if I come at it from like a forceful perspective with my beliefs are right and yours are wrong, then like there's no, there's no progress there. There's no interaction. It's a complete waste of time. Like wasting all of our breath. Like Mm -hmm. no one's going to change their opinion or their views. It's only when we go and like stop and like actually listen to what somebody else is saying that I think that we can really hear them. I love it. And I love what you say about those being different than maybe what they would have been five or 10 years ago. So true. I think that that like life experience is such a great perspective and I'm sure they'll be different five or 10 years from now too. Um, I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be bored out of my mind. I don't know. (laughs) What about one thing that 
you're really disappointed if I said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> what about one thing that you're working on or that you think would have a big impact on your health, but you are just not implementing it? Mm. I mean, like right now, I'm like looking at like like the kettlebell that's like sitting in my room. That like I <laughs> I kind of believe that like you know even if we don't have time to go and like do like a full blown workout or whatever, like we you know I could go and take literally five minutes and go and do mm -hmm. some swings some whatever, some presses, something like some, you yeah. know, uh, goblet squats. I could do some like Turkish get ups. I can do it in my bedroom. I can go and do it right now. And we go and, you know, get off this call or whatever. Like yeah. it's kind of like uh, that, that's the main, main thing is like, and I heard a really cool Ted talk about this and this lady, oh. um, I don't remember the name of the Ted talk, which is kind of, we'll have to find dramatic. it so we can link to it. Um, so yeah, it was like, uh, I'll, I'll text you the link, um, Robin something, I think was her name. But okay. anyway, she basically talked about like, you know, she was going through a really rough time in her life and things were not going so well with her family. And like, she just had this, like, you know, she was like constantly like hitting the snooze button, you know, and not wanting to face the world. And like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, then she had this moment where she was like, no, kind of screw that. Like, and she, she's like this next morning, like, um, she saw like a NASA rocket ship and she's like, that's going to be how I'm going to go and approach this. And so she just hmm. like mentally started this whole thing of like a countdown from like five, four, three, two, one. And then like, boom, you just jump in and do it. Yeah. And you know, it's like, that's, that's kind of that idea of what I'm talking about. I don't need to sit there and like deliberate like the exact perfect wad or whatever I need to go and do. It's like, no, like just five, four, three, two, one, go pick up that kettlebell and do, like something. do something. That's great. I've been into that too, like just doing five minutes of something lately, like just trying to adjust to the new schedule of residency and especially in the morning, like being tired and wanting to hit the snooze. But sometimes, like lately, I've just been jumping up and doing like some burpees or jumping on the bike for like two or three minutes and just doing anything to get your heart rate up then all of a sudden yeah. like it's it's like okay i can do this i'm ready for the day like i'm awake that's pretty cool <laughs> i get a little too reliant on this yeah <laughs> you know? so, yeah that can help it's, too it's but... getting heart rate going. it doesn't necessarily need to be like a, yeah <laughs> a stimulant form uh can be other things as well <laughs> totally totally all right last question is what does a healthy life look like to you i think I think it's living a life on your terms for some greater good, some greater, some greater purpose that like is sort of beyond you and like whatever that means for you. It's like, just because like somebody says like you got to do X, Y, or Z or something like that, like, or that's the you know smart thing to go and do. Like if if you feel really really like strongly otherwise, like you need I think to go that that way, right? Like following your calling. I guess as, as to summarize, it would be Joseph Campbell. His quote was "Follow your bliss." Mm. He said, which I think to me is like it's so much more clear than like even like the pursuit of happiness. Like happiness, like we all have like happy moments you have sad moments but like mm -hmm. bliss bliss is like sheer joy mm -hmm. and those moments where we're experiencing like sheer joy those are few and far between but it, they're easier to identify and I believe that the more moments that we have of like true blissful moments like the better life we're going to live and the better we're going to be for the world better we're going to be for ourselves better we're going to be for our families and people we love and so yeah, I said, follow your bliss and the universe will open doors where previously there were only brick walls hmm. and doors will open for you that would not have opened for anyone else. That's amazing. That's a perfect note to end on. <laughs> Thank you. Right as I was getting a big time call for somebody randomly. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that showed up on the <laughs> audio, okay. but yeah. No, thank you. This is awesome. Like, you know, after being like a huge fan of you and watching you compete and getting to talk to you at the games that year too was, was amazing. And like, you know, to be able to stay in touch and see what you're doing now. Like, I mean, I've just been a huge fan of you from afar and like thinking it's so important. Like 
you know, you bring like the academic credibility to, you know, and like an awareness towards like a, a thing that I'm super passionate about in terms of like medicine and all that that we've talked about like at length here mm -hmm. and a totally fresh perspective, you know, not dissimilar from the perspective that coach Glassman brought to fitness, you know, and it's like, you're a part of that movement of bringing that to, to health. And like, it's really freaking cool. Um, to see what you're doing. And like, you know, just, it's very cool to be connected in some small way, help you do that. Wow. Thank you. That means a lot. And likewise, I'm a huge, huge fan of everything that you do. And it's been cool to, you know, it was awesome to meet you, but cool to see all the things that you're continuing to do. And I can't wait to see what your next mountain or your new photos or, you know, videos turn into. So I'll still be following totally. along. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll, you yeah, know, so. next time you go to a family medicine conference, let me know so I can go. <laughs> Right, I was gonna say like we need to go and plan something to go and you know yeah, yeah. connect and I don't know do that in the future. I would have tripped out if you had like walked the, like been in the room randomly like there at the conference. It's been so freaking crazy. But um, tell everybody that I said hello when you see him next. So <laughs> yeah, will too. <laughs> awesome. It's, well, thank uh, you so much, Kyle. Cool group of people. <laughs> thank you, Julie, for sure. Talk soon. Hey there, thanks so much for tuning into this episode. As I mentioned before, I absolutely loved our conversation. We went in so many different directions that I wasn't expecting, and I learned a ton from speaking with Kyle. Um, it was awesome to hear his perspective about his interactions with the medical system growing up and now how he's able to speak with physicians and share his experience. So I'm wondering from your perspective, what advice do you have for healthcare professionals about how to better serve their patients? Let me know on social media using hashtag pursuing health. To make sure you never miss an episode and to receive exclusive content from me, head to my website, juliefouché.com and subscribe to my email list. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and consider giving the podcast a five-star rating on iTunes. Also, don't forget to share your stories. If you or someone you know has used lifestyle to overcome a serious health challenge, please send me an email at info at juliefouché.com. I'll choose some of these inspiring stories to share here on future episodes. Don't forget you can train with me through Beyond the Whiteboard by visiting trainwithjuliefouché.com. Thank you again so much for listening, and I'll catch you next time on Pursuing Health. This episode is brought to you by Mobility Wad. Do you struggle to get into good positions in your training and workouts? Are your movement compensations causing you undue pain and grief? MWOD's belief is that every human being should be able to perform basic maintenance on themselves. For nearly 10 years, Mobility Wad has been the go-to for the world's best athletes and teams. Do you know what hundreds of Olympic and world-class athletes, professional teams in the NFL, MLB, basketball, hockey, rugby, and soccer, and dozens of universities all have in common? They use Mobility Wad to train and compete at their best. I first took Dr. Kelly Surratt's Movement and Mobility course in 2013, and since then have read his books and followed his videos for ideas on how to address my own movement restrictions. But sometimes having all this information can become overwhelming, which is why I think the real genius is in the MWOD subscription. As part of this subscription, you have access to not only hundreds of hours of video content that can be filtered based on your specific questions, but also a daily 10-minute Mobility Wad video. You just log in and follow Kelly's instructions as if he is there coaching you in person for 10 minutes per day. You may pick up certain exercises that you wish to incorporate on a regular basis before or after your workouts. But at the very least, by following this daily program, you know you are addressing a wide range of movement patterns and body parts on a regular basis without having to think about it. I often do these sessions first thing in the morning or before bed as a way to wind down from the day. In addition, you have access to an on-ramp sequence and a 14-day mobility challenge that helps you understand the basics and identify the areas you personally need to focus on. You can lean on the MWOD community and discussion boards to learn from others who have been through similar situations or injuries. And if you need more personalized help, you can use the MWOD list to find a like-minded practitioner in your area. It's easy to become part of the Mobility WOD community, but for being a Pursuing Health listener, you can receive 20% off an annual membership with code Julie Fouché. That's J-U-L-I-E-F-O-U-C-H-E-R. 
just visit www.mobilitywad.com. Full potential, full power. Mm -hmm.